only recently went to Mexico City, filed for citizenship papers, and is fighting under the banner of Mexico. There is Oriwa. He is a terrific young fighter, as all the Nigerian fighters have been. But there is Hector Lopez. He both men proficient in earlier victories, and in the first round, sparkling boxing. Perhaps the edge went to Lopez, who is doing very well indeed. But it could have been called an even round. Action from the first bell to the closing bell of that first round. And they're right back at it now. From the Podcast Detroit studios and Zoom everywhere else, the making of champions. Professional boxers inspiring amateur athletes to become champions. Presented by Joe Lewis, champion of them all, Furbin, in association with USA Boxing, Golden Gloves of America, and BigFightWeekend.com. Join your hosts, Tanya Cole and Marquise Johns, with special guests from around the world of amateur and pro boxing, celebrating the legacy of Joe Lewis, whose status as the first African-American national hero showed the importance of being a leader and a role model inside and outside of the ring. Thank you for joining us on the Making of Champions. If you thought last weekend's fight with Caleb Plant and Caleb Truax was the thing to watch because Fox drew in 1.6 million viewers, listen up for our next guest. This fight is the next one to watch. Marquise Johns with Big Fight Weekend. Who do we have? Absolutely, Tanya. And as, as in regards to that Caleb Truex plant fight last week, and numbers don't lie, but that one probably did a little bit. But we're joined this week on this program <laughs> by a man who was going to be facing up uh, any main event on the ESPN undercard of, of all of a sudden, I, I drew a complete brain fart on the ESPN undercard fight between Joe Smith Ju- between on the main event of Joe Smith Jr. taking yes. on Maximum Vlasov fighting in the Las Vegas bubble on MGM Grand. Uh, but we're joined by the man who's going to highlight the undercar portion on the ESPN Plus portion of the program. We're joined by uh, Adam Lopez, who is taking on Jason Sanchez. Adam, how's it going, yeah. man? I'm doing good, man. How you doing? Pretty good, man. Hey, uh, uh, first things first, before we talk about your fight uh, this upcoming w- next weekend, uh, talking back to the Wayback Machine, man. Uh, in 2019, I was ringside for your fight down here in beautiful Kissimmee <laughs> uh, on the uh, Herring Edo card, uh, where you had a slugfest pretty much between Juan Carlos Rivera. The big thing that I remember about that fight was that you got knocked down first, and then you rebounded and took him out afterwards in the seventh round, man. Just walk me back to that fight, man, and how, and how, how everything went down. Yeah, um, Rivera is a very tough opponent. I knew it was going to be a tough fight. I knew I was going into his hometown, and uh, he had the, uh, you know, the audience on his side, and I went in there as the underdog, and uh, I went in there. I got dropped for the first time in a fight. I've never been dropped, and I got up, uh, shook it off, and I got back in, got back in uh, the fight, got my head back in the fight, and um, I made the adjustments. I got back to the basics and started using my jab a little bit more, and uh, I started breaking them down. And then once I saw he was slowing down a little bit, I went in for the kill. I got him with a good shot, and I, I didn't stop until he went down. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's funny about you mentioned the, the hometown crowd, Adam, because uh, uh, there was two fighters on that undercard uh, from Kissimmee that were pretty much local guys there. The guy you faced was from Orlando. There was also a guy before it that came from Kissimmee. Uh, both guys, uh, Tanya, went 0-2. So that's wow. what happened there. <laughs> what? Uh, also. <laughs> and the reason why I do want to ask you as well, uh, after that fight, I, c- I couldn't get out and have you on the show without asking about this. Uh, you took a fight on 24 hours notice, taking on Oscar Valdez, when his original opponent, Adrian Gutierrez, pretty much ate his way out of the fight, uh, coming into the <laughs> weight classes ahead of time. Uh, walk me back to that whole process and that whole scene, because my favorite quote out of that whole thing leading up to it at the weigh-in was Bob Arum yelling frantically on, I think it was either uh, Fight Hub or IFL TV who had the video coverage of him, just him cursing out his camp, out, Gutierrez's camp on the way out, man. Just, just walk me back to the process of you getting that fight and then how everything went down for it. Yeah, it was a crazy experience. Um, I was already on the fight. I was on the undercard. Mm-hmm. I was fighting at 126. Uh, I had already weighed in, made weight, did my face off and everything. And as I'm walking out of the weigh-in room, uh, my manager grabs me and pulls me back in. And they said, hold on, they got to talk to you about something. I was like, all right. <laughs> in my head, I was like, okay, maybe they want to do an interview or take some pictures right? or something. Yeah. And uh the look I saw on my coach buddy's face was a was it was something was up. I was like, I right, something's going on. What happened? Yeah. And they told me, and I was like, kind of shocked at first to hear it. I was like, really? And they're like, yeah, you want to fight Oscar Valdez? I was like, I would love to fight Oscar Valdez. And uh, they said, yeah, his opponent came in 11 pounds heavy, and they need a replacement. It'd be for tomorrow. 
uh, do you want to do it? And I told Buddy, I was like, yo, I could beat this guy. And Buddy said, all right, if you think you could do it, I believe you. And Buddy didn't watch no film. He didn't know who Oscar Valdez was. He just said, all right, if you think you got it, I, I trust you. I believe in your skills, and let's go handle business. And then, boom, it just went on like that. Round number one to get things started. Two left hands from Lopez, and then a right hand to the body as he's testing that belt line. Okay. Both men going to the body. A little bit of separation and almost an opportunity for the uppercut. Break. Being able to hear commands. Number four of our co-feature that has been so entertaining. Finally seeing the Matador come alive. And as he triples up that jab, the Matador, Adam Lowe. Oh, good work with the jab. Good jab. What a good way to start. Night number two as boxing is back. A majority decision. That's awesome. And speaking of that fight, and you, and, you, and the funny thing about that fight too, Tanya, and I'm, you made Mills as well, Adam got the Oscar first in the uh, opening stands of that fight, uh, knocking him down. Uh, the one the question I want to ask about in the second round, actually, I do want to ask you about this, Adam, because I thought the stoppage was kind of weird on my part, man. Uh, I know it, at the end of the day it is what it is, but if you if you could turn back time on that fight, uh, do you think this, the ref made the right call on that one? Not at all. Um, I would understand if I was taking damage throughout the fight, and then, you know, he ended up hurting me, but Throughout the whole fight, uh, Oscar did not land big shots. That was his first little little bit Glorious. of success he had in the fight. And um, they they found an opportunity to stop it, and they stopped it. And I think if the ref knew there were seven seconds left and um, how close the fight was, he should have definitely let it go on. Um, I would have been – I was already recovered. I, was, I felt good. As soon as I got back to my corner, got some water, I would have been, I would have been fresh going into the next last two rounds. But, um, you know, I was boxing and can't do nothing about it now. Uh, I did my best, and a lot of people give me a lot of respect for that fight. They certainly did. I think they said that you were bigger in defeat um, than ever in winning. Yeah, definitely. Hey, I wanna... Go hey, ahead. Tanya. No, go oh, ahead. Yeah. Oh, yeah, simple enough. Yeah, well, well I'll just a bit of backtrack and we keep wrap up my portion of this part of this. Uh, your last fight in the bubble process uh, was against uh, – uh, Lewis Coria, where you came out on top, a uh, majority of the decision. Uh, I stop, of the I stop. final round. There you go, forward with the one, two. Look at those eyes of Lopez. They look a little bit shut to me. Both eyes are badly swollen. A lot of swelling there on both eyes. Coria on the inside, taking those steps forward. One, two, a stop and pop as Correa crossed that threshold. Lopez was able to find him. Another right hand as he came in. Who's got something left here in these last 20 seconds? They have thrown a lot of punches here tonight to get this started. He's coming to me! Serious swelling around both eyes for Lopez. They're going to take it to the wire. What a good way to start. Night number two as boxing is back. Over 700 punches thrown by Lopez. Over 800 plus from Correa. And fine work throughout. It's yeah, it's tough. It's a tough experience. Uh, when I fought Correa last year in June, <clears throat> um, they had me there for about a week. I think I got in on Sunday, and I fought that weekend or, or Thursday or something like that. So I was there for some time. Um, <clears throat> you got to learn the rules. You're you're on a schedule on what times you could eat, what times you could work out. Uh, other than that, you have to stay on the hotel floor. Um, so there's not much you could walk around on. I was just walking up and down the hallways in the hotel room, um, just trying to keep my mind busy, go in, go in my room, watch some TV. And, yeah, you got to just kind of sit around and wait and be told what to do and when you can do it. <laughs> it's kind of a weird feeling. Um, but luckily, this fight, I'm only there for about two days before the fight, so I won't have to experience it too much. Um, the food isn't the best. I didn't have – Oh. Yeah, I didn't really like the food that much, so <laughs> I started talking to uh, the, the staff at Top Rank, and I was like, hey, do you think I could order some room service from the restaurants downstairs? And they allowed it. They said, yeah, we can make it happen, so give them a call. Uh, that's how I started eating. I was eating all my meals through the, the, the restaurants downstairs. Mm -hmm. I was just calling them, 
they bring the food up and I'd eat like that. So I'd have a little better food than uh, what they were offering, but I just had to pay for it. But I didn't mind, you know, I have, to, I got to eat right before my fight. Absolutely. So, so you were stuck in this hotel room for a week, man. Uh, watching television. I don't see you watching Law and Order reruns all day, man. What are you, what are you watching? Uh, whatever's on, to be honest, I just find something. Um, I really can't remember what exactly I was watching during that time. Um, was it Food Network, I'm guessing? <laughs> That's time nah, I wish, man. Uh, <laughs> honestly, it's whatever I could find on there. But um, the, luckily, I had my two coaches with me, you know. So anytime I wanted to go for a walk, I'd just call one up. Like, hey, let's go for a little walk. And he'll just walk with me up and down the hallways. And we'll just talk game plan and talk, you know, just talk and, you know, keep my mind busy and uh, be in good spirits. Now, I know for that particular fight, um, I wonder if the conditions had anything to do with your performance. You threw over four to actually over 1,400 punches were thrown during that fight between the two of you all. Um, but you gave yourself a C for performance. Why is that? And how do you think you're going to improve on that for this upcoming fight? Um, that fight, I didn't have the best training camp. It was, okay. it was fresh off of quarantine, COVID. Like COVID had just hit and everyone was, you know, staying inside. I didn't know exactly what it was and how to deal with it and Nothing. So I was out of the gym for about two, two, maybe three months. And um, okay. And then for some reason, I just felt like I had a fight coming up. I was like, yo, I have a feeling they're going to they're going to reach out to me because I started hearing they're going to bring fights back in June. So um, I, I talked to my coach. I was like, hey, how's the gym looking like? Is it clean? Like, is there not so many people there? He said, yeah, it's pretty empty. Like, come come check it out. So I went for about a week and a half. Um, just, you know, started shaking off, you know, getting back into the rhythm of it. Mm -hmm. Week and a half later, after I started, they gave us the phone call. Hey, can Adam be ready in four weeks? And uh, I checked my weight. My weight was pretty good. I was only about like 10, 12 pounds away. And I was like, yeah, I think I can make it happen. Um, so I went into the fight, just fresh off of quarantine. Boom, get ready for a fight in like five weeks. And uh, I've never done that before. For me, I'm always in the gym. Even when I don't have a fight, I'm in the gym at least four or five days a week, just shaking off, you know, sweating, working on stuff with my coach. Um, so I think that alone, it just, I went in there kind of flat, not not um, in the best shape. Um, I actually, like, the last week of sparring, my coach was like, look, you're looking really bad right now, and I might have to call the fight off. He's like, if you don't show me some of these last few sparring sessions, I'm gonna have to call the fight off. And I said, no, nah, buddy, we got this. Don't worry. I'm, I'm come right. I'm gonna come correct right now. And I just kicked it into the next gear, and I just dug deep, and I did really good those sparring sessions, and I went into the fight um, like that. But yeah, that sparring. I mean, that camp. I was getting. I wasn't doing too good in sparring. I was kind of getting beat up by almost everybody, and uh, <laughs> I just didn't have the most confidence going into the fight. I didn't have the best conditioning going into the fight. So that's why I was pretty surprised how much I did punch. But, um, I mean, I was just in the heat of battle, and, uh, you know, my adrenaline was rushing, and I was in there. And, um, yeah, it wasn't the best preparation for the fight, and I, I wish I didn't rush the fight. But, you know, I put on a, I still put on a good show. I came out with the W. I came that's out right. with the NABF title. Um, but it's definitely a learning lesson. Um, but, you know, it was a good fight for the fans. Okay. I'm going to um, head back and talk a little bit about um, Buddy McGirt, your trainer and your coach. Um, I know that you had said about him um, that he's given you a lot of guidance and advice over the past several years that you've been with him. And one thing that you said is that you took all of your hardest fights early on in your career. Because, in fact, this, this past fight that we were talking about, you said was one of your toughest fights. How has he prepared you mentally and physically um, to be at the stamina that you are right now in terms of you're this close um, to getting another title? How has he prepared you? Um, he's prepared my mind more than anything. Um, he showed me that this is a, you know, this, it's a marathon. This boxing game is a marathon. You know, you, you got to take your time with it. And you got to take the proper steps. Early on in my career, I was just willing to fight anybody, anywhere for any type of money. I didn't care what I was getting paid. I just wanted to fight. Um, but, you know, you, I'm taking on those tough fights and there's no eyes on the fight. People don't know who I am. So I'm not really getting any recognition for those type of fights and those type of wins. Um, so he was just teaching me the boxing side more, you know, and what it takes to, to make it to the top and how to become a superstar and how to, you know, hold yourself and carry yourself throughout those, 
you know, that process. Um, but he's definitely, you know, since since he started with me, he's been in my corner since my fourth professional fight. And uh, I got 16 now. So we've been together for some time. And he's just been grooming me, you know, grooming my mental state, uh, my mindset, grooming my skills in the ring, grooming how I should talk to different managers and promoters and how to carry myself and what I should be getting. And he's just showing me the ropes all around. You know, um, I wonder if it's just simply because it's in your DNA. You've been in the gym since you were two and you had your first sanctioned fight um, when you turned 12. How has your father influenced you? Uh, he was everything. Your interest in boxing. Everything for me. Um, if it wasn't for my dad, I probably would never have been boxing. Um, unfortunately, my dad never raised me. I never grew up with my father. My mom, my mom raised me, um, and my mom never wanted me to box because she was with him throughout his whole career, and she saw how you know it's a it's not the best business out there, and it's it's a tough sport. Um, she didn't want me to go through it. Um, but something in me just since I was a kid, since I was able to walk, I always knew this is what I wanted to do. And she put me through all these different sports, football, basketball, soccer, everything. And I, I always had fun. I was always very athletic. But once I got to a certain age, I just told my mom, like, hey, I'm going to start boxing. And I found a gym uh, in, in the neighborhood that kids were going to at my school. And I just followed them over there and I started training on my own and I made it happen. And my mom supported it eventually. She's like, okay, this is what you guys want to do. You guys got to do it correctly. You know, this it's, it's not a, it's not an easy sport. You got to be very disciplined. Mm -hmm. You're going to miss out on a lot of stuff. And I said, okay, I mean, this is what I want to do. So I'm going to do what I got to do to, to make it happen. Um, and that's just how it kind of how it went. To share with us a story that um, your father said about you um, when you were about three or four, when he knew the moment that you were going to be a great boxer. Um, he he just always saw me. Uh, he said when he would watch me when I was younger, he would uh, he would see me just shadow boxing in the backyard by myself with like a mean face on, like I was fighting somebody, and he just saw the passion behind it. And uh, he just knew it. He said, oh, yeah, he got it. He got it without even me teaching him nothing. He's like, he just he just wants to do it on his own. I can see he got it inside of him. And uh, he would just tell me stories about that, and it would make me laugh because I don't remember doing it. But it's just obviously part of my DNA. It certainly is. It certainly is. Um, what do you think your father's legacy is? Tell us about, uh, for those of us that don't know, that might not know out there, and there shouldn't be very many. Tell us who your father is and what is his legacy, not only for you, but for boxing. Uh, he was a man who did it on his own, um, his way. He did it um, not the most conventional way. Uh, you couldn't really tell him how to do a certain thing or he would do it the other way. Um, but he was, he was a good dude with a good heart, and uh, he always came to fight. Quinto Lopez, who is doing very well indeed, but it could have been called an even round. Action from the first bell to the closing bell of that first round, and they're right back at it now. only recently went to Mexico City, filed for citizenship papers, and is fighting under the banner of Mexico. There is Oriwa. He is a terrific young fighter, as all the Nigerian fighters have been. But there is Hector Lopez. He both men proficient in earlier victories, and in the first round, sparkling boxing, perhaps the end. He, he was not the most conventional fighter. He was very awkward in there, um, but he was tough. And he was willing to fight anybody, anywhere. And that's kind of how I followed my career as well. Um, 
but yeah, he was one of a kind, you know, one of a kind who came from Mexico, who came up in Los Angeles. He was um, a tremendous fighter. And unfortunately, he never got a world championship, but he did a lot in the boxing world. And a lot of people do remember who he is. Say his name. Hector El Torero Lopez. There you go. There you go. Now, tell us about your mom. I know you mentioned that she never wanted you um, to box. You, in fact, played basketball and you were a quarterback um, for a high school football team. What made you walk away? Um, it was weird. Uh, my last year of football that I was trying out for the team, I was started quarterback. Um, season hadn't started yet. School season hadn't started yet. It was over the summer. And I was still boxing on the side. So I was going to practice and then I'd go go to the boxing gym. And then I had a fight set up. I was like, all right, I'm gonna get one more fight in before season starts. So we had football practice and then we had like a I think we had like a month or a few weeks off until school started. So that those few weeks off, I, I was like, I'm gonna go set up a fight within those few weeks. So I I where was the fight at? I think the fight was in Arizona. And we drove to Arizona. I had a fight. I won. And something about that trip, just driving over there, going through the process of everything and going in there to someone's hometown and beating them and then coming home, mm -hmm. something just sparked inside of me and told me, like, yo, I know this is what I want to do. I'm, I'm wasting time with this football stuff. I'm going to just stop going. And I didn't show up to practice anymore after that. I didn't call the coach. I didn't do nothing. I just disappeared, and I went straight to the boxing gym. And since that day, I just held on, and I just never looked back. Thank you for that. More on the making of champions when we return. Well, let's say hello to senior writer, bigfightweekend.com, Mark Keyes, John. So we're back on the making of champions. Mark Keyes, what do you have down there in your corner? Absolutely. Uh, Ab, I wanted to speak to you about your upcoming matchup against Jason Sanchez. Uh, Sanchez, uh, as you know, uh, and those who haven't been paying attention, has a common opponent with Adam, which was the mentioned before, Oscar Valdez. Uh, just in preparation for your fight, Adam, uh, this upcoming next weekend, uh, have you seen anything on Sanchez uh, film-wise, anything they can break down? Uh, if this else about him that you've seen so far? Uh, Sanchez, he's very tough. He's a very tough opponent. I know he's coming to fight. He's coming 100%. Um, but... As I've told everybody else, I think there's levels in this game, and I don't think he's near the same level as me. Um, and I'm going to show that come next week. Uh, he was given a shot with Oscar Valdez. He was given a full training camp and notice of who he was fighting, and I believe if I was given that opportunity, I would have stopped Valdez. Um, so I think there's two different, two different beats coming in the ring next week, and uh, I'm going to show that. Absolutely. And that was the one thing I noticed just looking back on it. Look, uh, his fight with Valdez, that, you had, that was his, uh, at the time, the, the uh, mandatory for, for it, he was a different weight class. Uh, pretty much he was in the ring for, for 12 rounds, but he didn't do anything pretty much outside of getting outboxed. Uh, is that pretty much your game plan going into this one? Yeah, I've noticed he's been outboxed by Valdez. He's been outboxed by Christopher Diaz. Um, for from Diaz. what I've noticed, mm -hmm. he's... He likes to fight. He likes to sit in there and fight. He wants you to sit with him and fight. Um, and that's not who I am at all. I'm going to use my skills. I'm going to box him. I'm going to break him down mentally. And then once I see he's mentally fatigued and not all the way in the game, that's when I'm going and plan my, plan my attack. Well, I know you're known for your piercing combination. So you think you're going to take it uh, all the rounds? Or do you think you're going to try to do some sort of elimination early? Yeah, I don't think he's going past six. I can't see this fight going past six. I'm going to definitely break him down early okay. and get him out. All right. All right. So what I do know, um, and I'm going to take you back a little bit, is at the beginning of this week, you celebrated and honored your father. It was his birthday on February 1st. Yeah. We're going to wrap up this week um, today honoring him um, because I know that you said often that you fight in honor of him. Close us out with some final words, some final thoughts about you as a boxer, this upcoming fight. Tell us when and where and how we can watch it. And tell us about his legacy. Uh, my dad was one of a kind. He was a very tough, tough individual and always had a very positive mindset in any situation he was in. And he always 
seemed like the cards were always stacked against him, but he always made it work somehow. Um, and he taught me the, the same same way to look at life. You know, wherever you're at, just stay positive and keep pushing no matter what. Um, and that's what I've been doing since my whole career, you know. I've always been the underdog, and I'm trying to come up, and now people are starting to see my name, and they see what I could do. So now I'm slowly no longer to be being that underdog, and I'm, I'm making a name for myself. Um, my dad would be very proud of me. You know, handling the business, how I'm handling it, handling the fights, how I'm handling it. Um, yeah, I know he'd be very proud. He was he was one individual who uh, he was just he was just one of a kind, one of a kind guy. Um, but yeah, you can catch my fight next week, February 13th on ESPN Plus. I'll be there defending my title and ABF title, and uh, you can see me see me in action. Marquise Johns, how can we find you on Big Fight Weekend? You can find me on, at Big Fight Weekend at BigFightWeekend.com or on Twitter at Week Sauce Radio. Absolutely. Okay. You can find me, Tanya Cole, on Joe Lewis Bourbon's Facebook page or, better yet, find us all on our YouTube page at um, The Making of Champions. We're going to close out with one last quote that your father um, would say to you, um, and I know you have it tattooed on your arm. I'd rather die on my feet than live on my knees. Keep fighting for your dreams. We're rooting for you. We'll see you in a couple of weekends. Thank you. Thank you.